Okay, ladies and gentlemen, we are busy with chapter 8, Internal Forced Convection. And with the previous lecture, I told you that the work that we've started, or that we're going to do in terms of a general analysis of heat transfer in tubes, is really the most important part of this chapter, and also the most important part that you need to know and understand when later on you get to chapter 10 or 11, with where you're, going to do it, where you're going to do heat exchangers. Right, and what is very important to understand is that the way how the heating or cooling occurs will influence the Nusselt numbers, the heat transfer rate. And in general, in literature, there are two different methods that are normally sufficient for most practical applications. And if you can do those two or understand them, then usually they are good enough tools to solve other problems with. And those problems, or two types of methods, are the constant heat flux method and the constant wall temperature method. And I've asked you with the previous lecture, divide your paper in two, and on the left hand side you do the constant heat flux, and on the right hand side you do the constant wall temperature, so that you can see the differences between the two. So, we are still busy now with the left hand side. So we're still busy with the constant heat flux side. We've done the theory, and now I want to do a very simple example to show you how you can normally apply the constant heat flux method. Now the problem, okay, now just, be, just before we get to the problem, let's, let's just go back to the theory again. With the theory, we've set a constant heat flux problem. The result of that would mean that if that is the inlet temperature, because every millimeter, the fluid would get the same amount of heat transfer. The result of that would be that the heat transfer rate is linear. Okay, and that is a very, very convenient thing and a very nice thing if you have an application like this. Because now you know the temperature, the mean temperature all over the tube. And it is the equation of a linear line. The temperature is mx plus c, where m is equal to heat equal to the heat flux multiplied by the perimeter of the tube divided by the mass flow rate and the CP. So it is a straight line. So it's very easy to get that point there. Now, if we want to get the surface temperature, then it is now a little bit more complicated. Well, not that complicated, but in principle, we know that delta T, or the heat transfer rate, is equal to the heat transfer coefficient multiplied by delta T. Okay. But if the flow is developing like here, then the heat transfer coefficient would be constant here, but it will not be constant there. So if we draw the heat transfer coefficient here, okay, it's going through like there. See there are the two points getting together. Okay, so, and that would be the point where you have fully developed flow, both from a fluid mechanics point of view and from a thermal point of view. So the heat transfer coefficient would typically do that, and from the point where it is fully developed, it would be a constant, right? And for that reason, because it's a constant here, that distance there will be a constant, you see? They are parallel to each other. In this region here where we've got developing flow, the wall temperature is going to change, so, because it's a function of the heat transfer coefficient. Right, so let's just show it with an example. So this is an example where we, you have a tube uh, in a nuclear application and the heat transfer rate is 50 kilowatts and it is uh, known that it is a constant heat flux problem, not a constant wall temperature. Right. The inlet temperature is 20 degrees Celsius, the tube diameter is 10 millimeters, the length is 5 meters, the mass flow rate 0.07 kilograms per second and the CP is 1080. So it is air if you look at those properties that you're talking of. Okay, so let's look at uh, the mass flow rate, of the heat transfer rate. The heat transfer rate is then equal to MCP multiplied by the outlet temperature minus the inlet temperature. Right. What do we want to do? We want to calculate that outlet temperature. So it's a very simple equation. You don't have to go and write it in a complicated format. Just go back to the basics. The heat transfer rate is 50,000. The mass flow rate is equal to 0.7, the CP is 1080, and 
the outlet temperature minus the inlet temperature, which is 20. And from that, we can solve that the outlet temperature is 86.14 degrees Celsius. So, with this temperature is 20, that temperature is 86.4. Okay. Apparently, the yellow doesn't it doesn't show that well, well on the video, so let me just draw it again. So, that is now the inlet temperature of 20, the outlet temperature of the fluid would be 86.14 degrees Celsius. Okay, very simple. Okay. Now, let's calculate the surface temperature. And we can do that by, let's first calculate the heat flux, the heat transfer rate divided by the surface area, which is uh, mm -hmm. sorry, no, no, yeah. Let me write it like that. The heat, flux is, the heat flux is equal to the heat transfer rate divided by the area. It's equal to the heat transfer coefficient multiplied by Ts minus Tm. Okay, so it's not a fancy new equation or anything like that. It's the simple equation of the, the heat transfer rate as a function of the heat transfer coefficient. And now we've got the surface temperature of the tube and we've got that temperature there. Okay, now if we now say, well, we have uh, 50,000 divided by the surface area, the surface area is pi, multiplied by 10 millimeters, multiplied by the length, which is equal to 5. And now, the heat transfer coefficient is 10,000. 10,000. And we have Ts minus Tm. Then we can solve that Ts minus Tm is equal to 38.83 degrees Celsius. Okay which is then equal to delta T. So if we come back to this graph, we know that up to halfway to 2.5 meters, okay, the heat transfer coefficient is a constant from this point of forwards. So therefore it means that this delta T must be a constant there. See, and that delta T is equal to 31 0.83 degrees Celsius. You see, very simple, nothing complicated. Okay, so we can now calculate that temperature there, the temperature of the surface E, TSE. So the temperature of the surface at the outlet would then obviously be 86.14 plus 31.83. Mm, and that is 118 degrees Celsius. Okay, so that is 118 degrees Celsius. Okay. Now, with this part, it now becomes more complicated because now the heat transfer coefficient is not constant, you see? But we've got the heat transfer coefficient at this point here. So let's just go and see if we can calculate the surface temperature at that point there. Well, how do we do that? do that? Well, firstly, we need to know what the temperature is here at one meter. Okay. So the mean temperature at one meter would be equal to Ti plus, or let me rather write it according to the equation of, uh, of mx plus c, the heat flux multiplied by P divided by the mass flow rate Cp, multiplied by x plus ti. Okay, the equation of the straight line. Okay, now the heat flux is equal to 50,000 divided by the, by the surface area, which is equal to pi, multiplied by the tube diameter, which is 10, multiplied by the length. Not very neat, but there's the heat flux. If you want to go and calculate it 
separately, then it is the heat transfer rate divided by the surface area, which is 50,000, divided by the surface area is pi 10 millimeters, multiplied by the length of 5, and that would give you a heat flux of 318,310 watts per square meter. Okay. So the heat flux works out as 318,310 watts per square meters. So you can first work it out like that and then put it in there, or you can do it directly. Okay, multiplied by x. x is how far from this point we want the temperature, and in this case it is at 1 meters. So at 1 meters, so that is the temperature Tm at 1. The mean temperature of the air at 1 meters. The mass flow rate is 0.7 and the Cp is, where is it now, 1080. And plus the inner temperature is 20 and that would then work out as um, 33.2 degrees Celsius. Of course, you could have said, ah, it is very easy. I mean, I know, I can see this delta T is 86 minus 14 divided by 20, so it is a 60 delta T over 5 meters. So you can use 60 divided by 5. You could have done it like that also, just as you, just as you want. Okay. So now we can calculate that temperature. We can say, the temperature of the surface at 1 meters minus Tm at 1 meters is equal to the heat transfer, is equal to the heat transfer rate, oh, sorry, it's equal to the heat flux divided by the heat transfer coefficient. Okay. This equation here, delta T is equal to the heat flux divided by H. In this case, we want that temperature difference there the surface temperature at 1 meters and the mean temperature of the air on the inside at 1 meters. Right, so it is then equal to the heat flux divided by H and the heat flux is 318,310 and in this case the heat transfer coefficient is now equal to 30,000. And that would give a delta T of 10.61. Am I right? Okay, and therefore, I can then calculate the surface temperature at point 1, which is then 10.61 plus 33.2. And that is 43.81 degrees Celsius. Okay. Does that make sense? Ladies and gentlemen, are you happy with it? Any problems? Yep. Uh, the mass flow rate, uh, blah, 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 blah. yeah, sorry, 0 0.07, correct? Okay. Difference what I mean sometimes, what I say and what I write. Okay. Any more questions? Right. That is the first type of problem. Now let's get to the constant surface temperature, which is now on the right hand side. So put them next to each other. Constant wall temperature. Okay. With a constant wall temperature, Ts is equal to a constant. Okay, the surface temperature is a constant. Where will we get these types of problems? Well, when we have phase change. Okay. 
phase change in mechanical engineering is very, very important. A large percentage of heat exchangers, we will have phase change. And the reason for that is it is the most effective types of heat exchangers that we can use as mechanical engineers. So in all boilers, condensers, etc., we've got phase change. Okay, so boiler in the Rankine cycle <laughs> to generate electricity with. Uh, on the condenser side with all the cooling towers is a condenser. And for example, in the heating and ventilation and, and air conditioning industry, we've got a vapor compression system. Again, there's a evaporator and there's a condens condenser. So in all those applications, we have a constant wall temperature. Right, now with a constant wall temperature, if we now look at this tube of us, which is now at TS, is a constant, and we would plot, again, the temperature as a function of X, and we would plot the heat transfer coefficient as a function of X. So if we have this case, okay, where the surface temperature is constant, then firstly the surface temperature on our temperature Tx diagram, there it is. It is constant, okay? And now we get to the case where this is the inlet temperature. Okay? And there's a temperature difference, so heat will be added, okay? So the temperature will increase, okay? But as the temperature increases, the driving force for the heat transfer rate is becoming less and less and less. So, coming back to what you've said yesterday, in this case, the temperature distribution on the inside, Tm, will do something like that. So it's different than the constant heat flux problem. In terms of the heat transfer coefficient, also do something like that as the flow is developing. In terms of if we do a little bit of calculations and specifically what we would like to do now is to track that temperature profile and specifically calculate that outlet temperature. Okay, so how are we going to do it? We're going to say, well, the heat transfer rate is equal to the heat transfer coefficient multiplied by the surface temperature multiplied by T average. Okay, because what delta T do we use now? Okay, so let's use T average. And T average is if we connect those two points there, and that is the bulk temperature. Okay, that is T out, T E. Okay, the bulk temperature is equal to the inlet temperature plus the outlet temperature divided by two. Okay. And T average would now be that temperature there, delta T average. Would you agree? It's a reasonably good assumption. Okay. Right. This is quite a critical issue, this now, the delta T. Okay. I've drawn it there, I've said, well, we can use that, but not one of you were concerned about it. And unfortunately, it is something to be very concerned about. Yes? Oh, sorry, I to mention, T average is very Okay, sorry. Um, let me see if I can make it more clear. Okay, uh, can you see very clearly um, let me use the yellow in this case. <laughs> okay. So I'm going, so that is the, uh, yeah, let me first use, uh, right. Okay, the blue is the inside fluid. Okay. The red or the pink is the wall temperature. Okay, right. Now, the bulk temperature would be when I connect these two points with a straight line. 
And by definition, we would say that the average between the inlet and the outlet is the bulk temperature, so that temperature there. So delta T average is now Ts minus Tb. Okay, so delta T average is equal to Ts minus Tb. Okay, right. Now, unfortunately, I do not have a lot of time to do the, the derivation in detail. But if you would go and look at the control volume of the flow inside it, and you would say that is equal to dx, and that would be the heat transfer rate delta Q, and the temperature on this side is Tm, and the temperature on that side is Tm plus dTm. Okay. And the heat transfer rate is equal to the mass flow rate CPT, and there it is equal to the, the mass flow rate CP multiplied by Tm plus dTm. Okay. If you look at that in terms of what is going in and what is going out, then you can say what is going in is equal to the heat transfer coefficient multiplied by Ts minus Tm. Okay. So this is this heat transfer rate, which is equal to the heat transfer coefficient multiplied by Ts minus Tm. Okay, so very importantly in this derivation, of course, is that the surface temperature is a constant. Okay. Okay, so what is going in is this heat transfer rate plus that m dot cpt is then equal to what is going out in terms of first law of thermodynamics, cptm plus dtm. Okay. Now I'm going to skip a few steps. The full derivation is in your textbook, textbook because I just want to show you in principle where it comes from. But what you now can do is you can start looking at the dtms Okay, and the result is if you go through the, through the derivation, you're going to end up with a term dTs minus Tm divided by Ts minus Tm is equal to minus the heat transfer coefficient multiplied by P divided by the mass flow rate multiplied by Cp and a dx. And now you can see the integration there. Okay, and with this term D, like dx of x, you end up with a lin term. Can you see it? Without doing all the mathematics in detail. There's a lin term that is going to jump out in terms of the temperatures. Right, and the result of that is, you can just go and do the steps at home, just in the textbook, but the result of that is that you're going to end up with the following, which is Ts minus Te divided by Ts minus Ti is equal to E to the minus NTU, where NTU is known as the number of transfer units, and that is equal to the heat transfer coefficient multiplied by the surface area divided by the mass flow rate and Cp. Okay, so that is the first thing that is going to come out of it. Okay. Okay. okay, now this N to U is a very interesting thing, the number of transfer units, and you're going to use it a lot in the chapter where you're going to consider heat exchangers. But let's look at, again, an example. Example, okay. And this example is an example where, again, we have flow through a tube, inlet temperature is 20 degrees Celsius, and now it's not a constant heat flux problem, but the surface temperature remains constant. And the surface temperature is 100 degrees Celsius. Okay. And the surface area is given, and the heat transfer coefficient is given and also the mass flow rate. Okay, so the mass flow rate is also a known. 
<laughs> it means that when we have this, we can actually go and calculate the NTUs, the number of transfer units. Now let's suppose the NTUs for a certain number of NTUs, okay, you've got the inlet temperature, you've got the surface temperature, you can go and calculate the outlet temperature. Okay. So if you would now go and calculate the outlet temperatures for different NTUs, then if the NTU is equal to 0.5, then the outlet temperature is going to be 51.5. If the NTU is equal to 1, then the outlet temperature is going to be 70.6. Okay. If the NTU is equal to 5, then the outlet temperature is going to be 99.5. Okay. Now just don't look at the numbers, what, but what would 99.5 degrees Celsius mean to you? If this tube is at 100 degrees Celsius on the outside, it means that the flow on the inside, for all practical purposes, is the same as the temperature on the outside. Do you agree? Okay. Now let's suppose you go and increase the NTUs. How can you increase the NTUs? You can increase the NTUs by making the tube longer for example. Okay. Now let's suppose the NTUs become 10, then the outlet temperature would be 100. Okay. Now with the design of heat exchangers, material is important because that is what you pay for. <laughs> so when you design heat exchangers, you, are, you will be very aware of the fact that the NTU of 5 is sort of the upper limit of where you can go to. If the NT uses five and already five, then there should be a question mark. <laughs> okay. But if it's five and more, you're just wasting material. No heat transfer rate, no heat transfer rate is just going to occur anymore. Okay, why? Because the temperatures is going to be for all practical purposes the same. And this is the problem with this type of surface temperature, where the surface temperature is there. Inner temperature is there, and now this is going to happen. Is that <laughs> right? Now we are not finished with the constant wall temperature case. What is also important is to again to go and look at this derivation. And if you go and look at this derivation, what can be done is that a very accurate temperature difference can be derived which is called the LMTD temperature method. So it would actually mean that this temperature difference here, that we have here, if we use this approach, we can do an integration from the inlet to the outlet. And the result of that is that an LMTD can be derived. And the LMTD would be equal to Ts minus Ti minus T is minus T E divided by the lin of T S minus T I divided by T S minus T I. And that is a much more accurate, accurate description of the real delta T in these types of applications. Okay. Now this equation looks very complicated, the LMTD equation, but it is a very simple one. Okay? It's very simple in the sense that it really helps if you go and make a, just a very simple sketch when you have a problem like this. Okay? And you determine that delta T at the inlet and you determine that delta T at the outlet. Okay, delta T at the outlet. And then you can say, well, the LMTD is equal to this temperature difference, delta the inlet, minus the outlet temperature difference, divided by the lin of those two terms. You see? So you take this temperature, there it is, minus that one, divided by the lin of this term, divided by that term. And it is quite a robust equation. Okay. In some cases you might end up with a negative sign, 
But if you look at the delta T, you'll see that it makes sense, that you can actually use it just like that. Okay, so what is the moral of the story? <laughs> the moral of the story is very important, very, very, very important. For the case where the surface temperature is constant. Okay. Delta T average, as I've shown you on the sketch, that delta T average, it's not going to give you accurate results, so do not use. Okay. You have to use the LMTD. LMTD is the right approach to use. Okay, any questions? Right, let's do a problem. And the problem is the heating of water in a tube with steam on the outside. Okay, so here is a tube. Okay, and the inner temperature and that is water flowing on the inside. Okay, so it is water on the inside. The mass flow rate is equal to 0.3 kilograms per second. Okay. And on the outside, we have condensing steam at 120 degrees Celsius. So all around the tube, we have condensing steam. So if that is the case, then we can actually say, well, it is the surface on the outside is constant, it is at 120 degrees Celsius. Okay, so we've got phase change on the outside, so it means the surface temperature would remain constant. Right, and we want to know, we want to heat the water from 15 to 115 degrees Celsius. So a delta T of 100, okay. And we want to know what must the length of the tube be to make that possible. What should the length of the tube be? Oh, yeah, and I forgot. The tube diameter, inner diameter is 25 moles, 25 millimeters, okay. Right. Now this outlet temperature of water of 115 the question might be, but is, is it not going to boil before the time? And yes, it will be if the pressure is atmospheric. But usually, when you pump water through a pipe, then the pressure would be much higher. So as long as the pressure is high enough, then the water will not boil. Right. So, ladies and gentlemen, do you understand the problem? Okay. So again, we have water flowing through a tube. On the outside of the tube, we have condensing steam. The steam is at a temperature of 120 degrees Celsius. The tube diameter 25. Because we have the condensing steam, we know that the outlet temp the temperature of the surface must be 120. It is given to us that the outlet temperature must be 115. And they ask us to determine what length of tube do we need to do that heating with. Right, so let's draw what is happening here. Okay, now firstly, let's look at the surface of the tube. The surface is at 120 degrees Celsius. Okay, so there it is at 120 and it's constant. Okay, do you agree? And then we have the water at an inner temperature of 15, which is now being heated to 115. So there's 15 and there is 115. So the delta T here at the outlet between the surface temperature and the water temperature is only 5 degrees Celsius. Now, we will need the properties of the water. The properties. And the properties, we need to de decide on a bulk temperature. Okay. 
or the temperature at where we're going to get the properties from. So the properties we get at the bulk temperature. And the bulk temperature, so if I can put it in here, there's the bulk temperature. Okay? So the bulk temperature would be in this case 15 plus 115 divided by 2, and that would be a temperature of 65 degrees Celsius. So in table A9, okay, ladies and gentlemen, you must start knowing your tables in your textbook where everything is, so don't wait until the test or exam. Please make sure you know where everything is. Right, so if you go and look in table A9 at a temperature of 65 degrees Celsius for water, then you can get the properties which are CP is 4187 uh, joules per kilogram Kelvin, uh, and HFG, I don't think we're going to use, need that, is 2203 uh, kilojoules per kilogram. Okay. okay. I'm just going to clean the board on the side. Now, if I look at this problem, I can see that for the water side, I have the inlet temperature, I have the outlet temperature, I've got the mass flow rate, and I have CP. So I can calculate the heat transfer rate of the water. Heat transfer rate of the water, which is equal to the mass flow rate, CP, multiplied by the outlet temperature minus the inlet temperature. The mass flow rate is equal to 0.3, the CP is equal to 4187, okay. the outlet temperature is how much? 115, the inlet temperature is 15. Okay. Very simple, the mass flow rate of the heat transfer rate to the water is equal to the mass flow rate CP multiplied by the outlet temperature minus the inlet temperature, JP. So the mass flow rate is equal to 0 0.3, CP is 4187, outlet temperature 115 and the inlet temperature is 15. So we can calculate the heat transfer rate as 125.6 kilowatts. Okay. Now let's go and calculate the LMTD. Okay. The LMTD is equal to, what is this temperature difference? 120 minus 15. Minus 15. Okay, minus 120 minus 115. Divided by the limb of those two terms, 120 minus 15, 120 minus 115, or 120 is 105 minus 5 divided by the limb of 105 divided by 5. Okay? 120 minus 15 is 105, the temperature difference here, minus the temperature difference here, which is 5, so 105 minus 5, the limb of those two terms, and the LMTD is equal to 3.287 degrees Celsius. Okay? Does that make sense to you? No. What's going on here? <laughs> Does that make sense? Yes. No way. <laughs> Look at this, 120 and 15. So you start here with a delta T of 105. Now you go to a delta T of 5. 
Do you want to tell me the average temperature difference is about three? Doesn't make sense, it's a trap. I've just checked you, 32.87. <laughs> you have to think, because it's so easy to make a mistake. Okay, and you must always look at the results and ask yourself, does it make sense? Okay, so 32 here, in terms of the numbers that we work with, makes sense. <laughs> but 3.2 doesn't make sense. Okay, right. So, where are we here? Uh, I'm not going, yeah, let me, let me put it in here so that I don't have to go to the other board. Okay. Right, so now we can say the heat transfer rate is now equal to the heat transfer coefficient multiplied by the surface area multiplied by LMTD. Mm, okay, very importantly I actually forget uh, the heat transfer coefficient has been given. The average heat transfer coefficient has been given as 800 watts per square meters degree Celsius. Okay, there it is, the average. Okay, now because it's the average, we don't have to worry about the inlet or the fact that the flow is developing or not. Okay, they've given us the average for the whole tube, which is 800. Right, so if we look at this now, and we look at the heat transfer rate, which is 125.6, is equal to the heat transfer coefficient, which is 800, multiplied by the surface area of the tube where the heat transfer will occur. It is pi multiplied by the diameter. The diameter of the tube is 25 millimeters, multiplied by the length. Okay? multiplied by delta T, and not 3, but 32.87 degrees Celsius, which is the only unknown. Okay. So I've used this equation to actually calculate the surface area, okay, the surface area, because the surface area would be determined by the outside multiplied by the length. Okay. And the result from this would be that the length would be equal to 61 meters. Okay. Now let's do it the wrong way. Yep. Uh, sorry, yeah. 125.6 multiplied by 10 to the 3. Yeah. Yep. Right. Let's do it the wrong way and see what will happen. Okay, so very important the wrong way. Okay, now, with the wrong way, it would be that we would say, well, we have the surface temperature, there it is, it's 120. This is the inlet, which is 15, and that is the outlet, which is 115. Okay, and what we do now is we calculate the bulk temperature, and the bulk temperature, we've done it already, is 115 plus 15 divided by 2 is 65 degrees Celsius. Okay? 65 degrees Celsius. And now we say the temperature, the delta T, the average temperature difference, is 120 minus 65, which is equal to 55 degrees Celsius, which is quite different than 32. Okay? So with LMTD, very accurately, we've determined it as 32 degrees Celsius because the integration occurs over the whole delta T. With this one, we do not do that. We just use that delta T there. And if we now calculate the length from the same equation, heat transfer rate is equal, equal to the average heat transfer coefficient, the area multiplied by delta T average, Okay, then 125.6, and this time I will remember the kilowatts. There it is. It's equal to the heat transfer coefficient, which has been given as 800, multiplied by the surface area where the heat transfer rate will occur. And the surface area will be equal to pi, multiplied by the tube diameter, multiplied by the length, multiplied by 55 degrees Celsius, 
and then very wrongly you will determine the tube length as too short 36 meters. Ladies and gentlemen, do you understand it? Good. Any questions? Nothing? In that case, thank you very much.